Um, this book, I'm going to sort of read, sort of talk. This book has come out under the radar. It was delayed in printing because of problems of shipping pa with paper during COVID, which delayed its launch. However, frustrating, it seems almost right um, because the time of COVID, the time of pause and quiet, isolation and contemplation was when this book was written. During the worst of the pandemic. So a quiet entry is not unlike the quiet beginning. Its subjects revolve around that time, the art of being alone. Everybody can hear me, I think I can oh, yeah. hear myself. Um, the gift of other species and other people and the pandemics that species other than our own have been going through long before that one hit us. The book is part elegy for how beautiful and complex the workings of the wild world are, but I don't think it's a despairing book. It's not a sad book. It's a collection of stories about what we have and what we're losing and how particular habitats and species work together, and how the relationships between humans and other species and the land and water they live on work together or don't. It also celebrates some main painters and others for their talent and grace. And it celebrates wild animals, bluefin tuna, humpback and right whales, diving ducks, alewives, wood frogs, and more. The thread that runs through it is this. It's a quote I take from Thomas Paine via Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> the times have found us. This is a book about the sharp fact that the times have found us. We have work to do. Many of us have become during these last three years increasingly grateful for what still abides. We pay more attention to the land we care for, even through volunteer work or through ownership, and to the water we love. And as the noted author and conservationist Carl Safina wrote, for better or worse, we attempt to shape the future in the present. So I did write, it, it, it's, this is a very, it's not, I'm not too loud, am I? No. It, it's okay? <laughs> because um, it, it might be better, I want to sit down, but it might be better if I sit here, because you might, the voice might carry a little better for you. I mean, we could try something else. Um, so I wrote columns in Demi's magazine for two and a half years. And um, Phil Conkling has now taken it over, by the way. He's doing a beautiful job. But I was restricted. I think Phil gets a few more words than I was allowed. I think he does. I was uh, given only 600 words. And if it was 605, we had to find five words to take out. But in, in the beginning, I really kind of fought it. And I kind of hoped I'd sneak a few in there. And the edited editor, who's Brian Kevin, is just wonderful. He's great to work with. But he was strict. And after a while, those little haiku essays, you know, it, I began to find a shape in them. And um, I began to like it. And so at the end of two and a half years, I had nothing left to say in that format. I, I was empty. And um, Downey's books asked me if I would maybe take some of them and uh, add some more and uh, write a book. So I said, OK. And one reason I said OK is because I've been looking at um, John Cornell's photographs of birds, and I saw this. 
I don't know if you've seen this book yet, but I saw this. And um, he's a fabulous photographer, and he's done photography here on the water in Maine. And so I asked him if I wrote a book, if I could use that for the cover. And he just gave it to me. Um, and uh, so we got a book in exchange. <laughs> um, what I thought I'd do um, is read excerpts from some of the essays, rather than one essay all the way through. And uh, I haven't chosen the long ones, some of the long ones I love, um, because I love the people in them. And I, I just want to tell you a little bit about that. Is that um, one is on Wayne Newell, and I've written about him two, two times, maybe three times before. He just died uh, this past winter. He's, uh, he, he was a Passamaquoddy, and he developed a way to write in the oral language. He did work with some experts at Harvard and MIT, and he was a courageous, marvelous man with a great sense of humor. So I wrote about him here. And um, another essay I wrote that's too long to read to you tonight is for years I've been trying to write about my mother and her hiking trip on Cape Cod. And so, <laughs> so with the um, COVID, I had this quiet time, and we, you know, we couldn't go anywhere. And so I took out the essay, and it's interesting to see your feelings about your mother. <laughs> it's not easy to write about your mother, uh, and how they kind of got a little fairer and a little better over time. And so that's a triumph of mine because I finally have it published. Um, so there are others like that. The last one I wrote called The Gull um, goes back uh, a long time to when I was little on Cape Cod. But, but um, most of these are about me. And the other thing is I live two different places. One, I live in Surrey now in a house in the woods with this little field in front. But when I first came, well, we lived in Mount Vernon. And then um, <clears throat> we moved to the coast to Coolsboro, to Prospect Harbor. So I'm going to read a little bit of both of those. But first, I'm going to blow my nose. You don't have a tissue. I'm going to go to the bathroom again. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, can we tell you something? Sure. Oh, well, later. Okay, later. About you. Well, I just said, have you read any of her books? And everybody said, no. And I no, said, no, I said, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I missed you know. all of them. And I said, well, they'll change your life. Oh, we all went. Oh, they changed your life. Changed my life. Yeah, I loved, I loved it. I went, I just the way you observed her. I loved it. What was the first? Because it was years ago I read it. I mean the New Year's Owl? What which one? It was called the New Year's Owl. And that settled, settled in the wild. Yeah. Settled in the wild. Settled yeah. in the wild. Is that yeah. Yeah. How is that? That's the one. Yeah, yeah. And it was wonderful. It was wonderful. beautiful. It was yeah. actually beautiful. Yeah, I touched those never Some of them I let go, but that one I <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I hope you like this one. Yeah. yeah. But, um, sure. I love you. Yeah, I, oh, thank you. So I, I want to join you, but I don't think that you're going to like it because my voice is better up here. It's also better when I stand up. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first one, I figured out what I was going to read you this morning. It's called The Beautiful Bones. And I'm going to uh, uh, cut some so I can get to another. We humans <clears throat> seem programmed to respond to the mix of function and beauty in successful evolutionary adaptations, 
as we might to the curves of a Michelangelo sculpture or to the brushwork of Rembrandt Brand's canvases. When I think of the cave paintings in Spain and France, I believe that a similar impulse, a love of function and beauty, drove these long ago people living up against the wild to make their art by the light of a burning torch. Among the works they left are the running horse, the stalking wolves, the delicate strength of a deer's legs, the long-legged heron in flight, and those bison herds, boulders of muscle and postures of intractable stubbornness. And then, too, they outlined the human hand, shapely and proficient. I stood in front of the skeleton of a bluefin tuna in a glass case on a wall in the lobby of the science building at the University of Maine at Machias. As my mind hurried over these things, this desire we have to celebrate the bodies around us that are honed by time to the tasks before them, to find food, to escape death, to mate. That bluefin, the bare architectural structure of a superb animal, touched me. It was animals that gave us our first lessons in aesthetics, and that's why we scrolled their images onto stone. Many of them were also good to eat, and we hunted them in small armed packs, but we also loved to watch the way they moved through their lives. Gail Krauss has taught biology at the university for over 40 years. That's a long time. But to watch her, you'd think she'd just arrived with the sort of energy and enthusiasm you'd expect of a professor at the outset of a promising career. <coughs> she came, in fact, in 1980 with her mother and bought an old farmhouse in town where her mother lived to be 104. And Gail earned a license to rehabilitate injured and abandoned wild birds and mammals. I can imagine arriving as a freshman and starting out at this nook of a campus in the Shire town of Washington County. What might you expect? Well, if you took a class of Gail's, you'd be caught up in her energy. I'm still learning. I'm still enthusiastic, she told me. In part, it's because of the field work. We use a lot of animals in my classes that wash ashore, so I'm always learn in a learning mode. It's not old for me. I don't know if it will ever be. In 2007, a marine warden who knew she was looking for the bones of animals for her classroom work called to tell her that a huge bluefin had come ashore in a marsh about an hour away. It was stranded, alive at first, but, but by the time she got to it, it had died and been scavenged. What was left had turned mushy in the August heat. It was maggot soup, she said. I put on my gloves and went through all of them to get out every bone I could. Nothing was articulated, everything was falling apart. The fish was about eight feet long. It had been chasing a school of smaller fish, most likely mackerel, through the inshore water on a high spring tide. She took what she could find back to the university, cleaned it up, and in 2011, she brought out the bones from where she had stored them and proposed putting the skeleton together in a course she named Skeletal Articulation an advanced semester for marine biology and environmental studies majors. Seven students signed up. We worked three to five hours every Friday. I told them it'll be awful, but let's try it. So we did. And we problem solved. We kept looking up information on bluefins. There wasn't much out there then. We'd find a lot on tuna steaks and sushi. They worked closely together, fitting bone to bone as the semester wore on. 
We used hot glue because we were just learning, and if we put some bones together incorrectly, we could simply use a hair dryer, melt the glue, take the bones apart, and try again. We couldn't pull, put all the gill filaments back together. They were just too small, but we got about a hundred of them to fit, and the caudal tail of the fish, it's shaped like a new moon. We had to learn which bones went on which end. We were taking apart other fish, like bass, to get some clue, but it didn't help. They're not alike. In the end, we learned so much. Now I can look at a tuna fin ray and guess pretty accurately where it might go. By the last days of the semester, they had assembled the bones, and it was done. An, Atl an Atlantic bluefin tuna larva, freshly spawned, and floating in the Gulf of Mexico is tiny. You can hold a couple dozen in the cup of your hands. But if it's a lucky fish, and that's an increasingly difficult thing to achieve today, it might grow to at least 6.5 feet and weigh over 500 pounds. It might live 40 years. The largest North Atlantic bluefin ever caught was pulled from the waters off Nova Scotia weighing 1,497 pounds. It was 12 feet long. Most people who know bluefins up close tend to remark on their beauty, their blue and silver colors, the gold wash across their sharply hung fins and spines, and the speed a whole school of them can muster. They are fish that swim just under the surface of the water although they can dive to 300 feet and can launch themselves into the air. Their flesh is red like the meat of a mammal. That's because their bodies have evolved a system of conserving the heat generated by the large muscle mass through an intertwining of veins and arteries called the rete mirabile, the miraculous net which protects the fish from the immediate chill of the surrounding water. The bluefins are endothermic, or warm-blooded. Although they do not hold a constant temperature like mammals and birds do, what they can do is keep their bodies 30 or even 40 degrees above the ambient temperature of the water, which gives them the freedom to penetrate much colder areas than fish without warming systems that are slowed by the chill. They move through the water of varying temperatures with speed and an exceptional alertness, and this rare adaptation in a fish has allowed them to course the open oceans, both horizontally and vertically. That bluefin skeleton hanging in the lobby of the science building has stayed with me. I think often about the majestic beauty and power of these animals, their long, swift peregrinations, the sight of a whole pack of them rushing just underwater. And I've thought about the students who put these bones together. Over the months, as they learned about the life of this fish, they picked up the large and small bones from the stainless trays, dipped them in glue, and fitted them into the places where they thought they belonged, along the spine, around the head, in the fins, crafting a testament to a wild life. That's not too far away from dipping a hand in paint to draw the body of a gazelle on a cave wall. <laughs> Now I'm going to read to you about one of my favorite people who, <laughs> who annoys people. <laughs> Quite a few people, I think. I just adore him. It's Henry David Thoreau. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we really know the man? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what I love is that um, uh, a woman who knew him said, and somebody took it down, that when a woman put her arm through his when he was walking down the street, 
It was like putting her arm into around the branch of a tree. <laughs> oh, you know that. No, but I just knew it had to be. <laughs> I thought, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, here he is. I bring him up again when I write about my mother. She loved him too. I've read Henry David Thoreau's account of his July 1857 trip with Joe Polis on the Allagash in the East Branch of the Penobscot at least three times, and this month I picked it up again. I have an old Apollo edition of the Maine Woods, and each time with a yellow highlighter or a pencil or a pen, I check the parts I especially love. The pages are covered with marks and comments, as if I'd traveled alongside Polis and Thoreau, although I would not have fit into that small canoe nor survived the carry into Chamberlain Lake. The tote road, according to Thoreau, was most likely made by muskrats and finished off by hurricanes. See, I think he was funny. <laughs> Two men of different histories and cultural persuasions on a trip together is an American fictional trope. Huck and Jim, Queequeg and Ishmael, Natty Bumpo, and somebody is, can correct me here, but I'm gonna to try to pronounce the um, Native American's name. Chinyachgook. Is that okay? Sure. This, however, is different. First, it's true. Second, it's a window into the closing of the 19th century Northeastern frontier. And finally, it probes the sensibilities of men who are part of our country's history. Henry David Thoreau, a white man from the village of Concord, Massachusetts, and Joe Polis, a Penobscot from Indian Island. They are both very good at what they do. One, an unparalleled writer, botanizer, and philosopher, whom E.B. White, with great affection, called a regular hair shirt of a man, and the other famously at ease in the woods and on the rivers and lakes. He knew how to read them, both the big parts and the small details. Thank God there is nothing politically correct in Thoreau's approach to the trip or to his guide. He writes what he thinks of Joe Polis and of himself, no matter how raw. To sentimentalize Polis would be to patronize him, a man of wit, self-respect, and curiosity about the world, much like Thoreau himself. Both men had endured periods of sharp suffering in their lives. Both were funny, ironic, and testy, and they pick at each other a little bit. Polis finds Thoreau somewhat dense and repetitive. Thoreau finds Polis' stories rather pointless. <laughs> <laughs> there is a point, however, at the start of the journey, when they are traveling by coach up along the river, away from Bangor, that Thoreau reports without any attempt to editorialize an exchange between a white man and Polis. He lets it stand as is. The white man announced he wanted to smoke and turned to Polis, demanding to know if he brought along his pipe. Polis was silent at first, ignoring what was really not so much a re as a request as an order to turn over his pipe. And then, when pressed, he said no. No one else in the coach said a word, knowing what was clearly playing out before them. A white man was free to take an Indian's pipe, and the Indian was required to hand it over. But Polis refused to put himself in that position. Suddenly, the reader sees how isolated Polis is in that cramped conveyance, and how brave. We can look back at this journey and find two independent and principled people on a canoe trip who arrive at a certain level of understanding in a troubled country that was struggling to understand itself. Thoreau at 40 had already spent his night in jail rather than paid taxes to a government that legalized slavery. 
he had spent two years in his cabin at Walden and written about it. And in two years hence, he would argue passionately for an appreciation of John Brown's failed rebellion. 48-year-old Joe Polis had represented his people in Augusta and in Washington. He was a leader, a teacher, who fought to keep open a grammar school on Indian Island because he believed in learning how to negotiate the ways of the dominant culture without losing one's own. He set a standard of, ex of excellence in a dark time. Many of us know that Thoreau's last words as he lay dying were Moose Indian. I like to believe he was reliving his time with Joe Pullis, maybe even paddling with him as a moose stepped out from the trees to the river's edge. On this each East Branch trip, we meet not only loggers sawing away at giant white pines, but Joe Polis, a man for whom wildness is comfortable, is home. Thoreau believed that even as we keep house in the village, as both he and Polis did, we need some unspoiled land beyond it, crepuscular and damp, or bathed with astonishing brightness, full of silence and sudden sounds, a great big place of danger and promise. And we need the people who know how to value it. <laughs> that part in the stage, that gets me every time. So, I have another one I want to read you. Are you up for it? do is maybe this one will take uh, maybe it would take 20 minutes. Do you, can you handle that? Is that, is that all right? Because it's seven. So I'll, I'm not starting right at the beginning, but it's chapter two. It's called Apprenticeship and we were living in um, Goolsboro in the little town of Prospect Harbor. And uh, we had bought, fools that we were, a 65-acre woodlot with a cabin in it with no electricity or running water, where we lived for 10 years. <laughs> uh, my kids still remember it with deep love, actually. So this was when uh, I'm unmarried now, but when I was married to um, my husband and we got there, we, we moved there. Um, it was sort of the back to the landers in the 70s. Um, when you're in your 20s, you're an apprentice. I arrived at the main coast then, a back to the lander who'd never learned from land, but was about to. I arrived with a husband and our one-year-old son. We had everything before us. I think of those years and I remember others who came from away and settled in places nearby and began trying to build a life in a village that hadn't seen an influx of people like us ever. Many failed. What surprises me is how many succeeded. When we did succeed, it was because we paid attention and worked hard. And frankly, because the people in the village who knew things we did not were gracious enough to teach us. First, there was the wood cutting and twitching and splitting and drying for the stove. Then there was the food, bread making, putting up vegetables for winter, visiting the boats at the dock for the catch of the day, and there was the winter. What can I say about the winter? The first year in February, I wore two wool hats to bed at night and held our son against me to keep him warm under piles of blankets. When our daughter was born, I did the same. I have to tell you, I can't remember if I wrote about the same happening in Settled in the Wild, but I just had to write it again, just in case somebody hadn't heard it, because I think it was kind of funny and fun. My husband's dream was to be a painter. Mine was to be a writer. 
But to get to those dreams, we had to figure out how to take care of ourselves and our children, make some money, and not freeze to death or burn the cabin down. For me, there was everything to learn, how to live, how to write, how to be in this woodland and begin to understand how it worked. We stumbled a lot and we got better. We got to know the people, the birds, the shore, how to grow food, how to, and this is important, talk with the people who lived here, who in fact made this village what it was. What I mean is we needed to learn to listen more than talk. People in the village back then didn't go on and on. They said what they had to say with often a quick intake of breath and a few words. I can't forget that first year and my trips to the laundromat in the town next door. I've told this story before, but for me, it is one of my teaching stories. And so I will tell it again. I'm not sure exactly what I learned from this story. Anyhow. I'd arrive with pillowcases of diapers, muddy stained work clothes, and once in the fall, after we had been told to cover our tomato plants with blankets at night so that they wouldn't freeze, an armload of blankets I had gathered that morning from the garden when it got too chilly for tomatoes, even with blankets. When I set them down in front of the women twice my age, sitting on metal chairs against the wall of the laundromat, waiting for their machines to be done, and whose husbands were the fishermen I'd met in the village. They stared at the floor. Following their gaze, I looked down. At least five garter snakes were slipping out from beneath the blanket folds, a bit stunned from the cold and the trip in the car. Poor things, I cried, and began gri grabbing them up shoving them into the carpet bag purse I bought at a yard sale. Poor things, I said again, as if the women hadn't heard me the first time. They sat stone-faced. <coughs> I'll be back, I shouted, and left with my writhing purse, driving home, returned the snakes to the frost-damaged tomato patches, and then went calmly back to the laundromat. <laughs> when I got there, the women were either folding their clothes with their backs to me or sitting where they had been sitting when I left, no expression at all on their faces, as if the snakes had never happened. I went about the washing. I got to know them better. Actually, I cut fish with them in the fish factory. So that's how we got to know each other. I got to know them better. And then I knew they, they'd had a riotous laugh at my expense, as well as saying some abrupt and perhaps even brutal words about people from away who seemed not only clueless but nuts. <laughs> when I came to Maine, the first room I wrote in was a tiny former chicken shed set back in the second growth hardwoods where we lived a mile down the pond road from the harbor. The shed was all mine. The chickens lived in a bigger shed a few yards away, closer to the cabin. I'd found an old Remington typewriter at a yard sale. I mean, <laughs> I was always going, we, we, you know, I was always going to the yard sale. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Sorry to come so late. Oh, well, it's nice to have you. So I've gotten as far as I'm riding in a chicken shed and going to a lot of yard sales. Um, I'd found an old Remington typewriter at a yard sale, managed to whack a few boards up to the sheds two by fours for a table and borrowed a chair from the kitchen. It was perfect. This was a summer only writing space, but those summers seemed almost endless with enough time in them to teach myself to begin to find my voice as a writer and to test what I believed. What to write about wasn't somehow the question. My husband and I had moved into the unfinished cabin on the woodlot, five minutes by bike from the working harbor. Eventually, we had two thriving children, 12, chicken, uh, 12 chickens, a cat, and two dogs. I was learning all that I could 
as people do when everything is new, about where I was in this world, its trees and wild birds and mammals, fish and fishermen, the women who knitted mittens for the village children for Christmas, and the big salt marsh where the cord, salt note meadow cord grass grew. Excuse me. I would write about where I lived as I discovered it. A maple sapling threw a delicate branch across the window of the chicken shed. During the day as the light changed with the sun's arc, the tree's green patterns changed and fluttered and shone. I had read and taken to heart Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. And I knew that to be a writer, one needed a private space and some unencumbered time to spend in it. And one needed the belief that to write even to write badly, because that is what one does a lot as a beginning writer, was okay. My husband and I spelled each other, and our children played in the gardens and in and out of the open doorways of the cabin, loose and free, and somehow, luckily, safe. I had also read Ian e. Forster's books, one of which is A Room with a View. It is about breaking convention in order to find out what one loves. All his books embrace the imperative of connecting to something outside oneself and of taking a chance on the wide world. Only connect, he writes. At night, by kerosene lamp, sitting at our kitchen table, I read Thoreau, Leopold, Abbey, Muir, learning the fundamentals of the environmental movement. Their words and the direction they gave are with me still. And I read E.B. White because he is the essayist, the best teacher of style, and he lived only a short distance down the coast in an old farmhouse with a big barn that he reassured his readers sheltered spiders in summer and fall. The sound of the Remington, the roller bar when I spun it, the arm when I flung it decisively, and the gleeful act of pulling a finished sheet of my own prose out of the machine gave me a sense of who I might be becoming. And I had met a man who held a license to rehabilitate wild birds. He taught me to take care of young birds, nestlings and fledglings. Once I was given a naked hatchling in a nest as neat as an English teacup that had fallen out of an elm in Castine, an upscale old town with a pre-revolutionary history about two hours southwest of where we lived. The bird survived, attended by me and my children, and became a red-eyed vireo. It lived in the shed, often perching on me as I wrote. As a fledgling, noisy and energetic, it needed more space, and I knew I had to release it soon. But when exactly? One late afternoon, I turned from the Remington to find an adult red-eyed vireo perched on the maple branch, staring in at the window. My vireo stared back, neither moved. Quietly, I approached the window and unlatched it. The young bird hopped onto the sash, then out onto the branch. The older bird reached forward through the leaves. Bill to bill, they touched. The young one pulsed its wings very slightly, and they flew off. Only connect. This was how my life grew toward the lives around me. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Wow. How beautiful is that? Thank you, thank you. Well, um, I think that's enough reading at you. Um, what? So does a phrase like that just, do you struggle with it? Does it just tumble out of your fingers? Do you breathe it in and it <laughs> lands on the paper? How does that happen? Are you a writer? Oh, I so want to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, I'm you, always so curious. Yeah. Don't you? You wonder how, yeah. how does anybody do this? Well, first of all, I mean, I'm going to be very honest with you. First of all, you know, I write with a computer these days. So there's the blank computer. And I have to start something. Um, I have an idea. 
I, I'm an essayist, really. And so um, I would do a first draft. And the f first draft is dreadful. I mean, when I was talking about young people just starting out and you know they have to allow themselves to work bad, I still do that. And so um, my first job, though, uh, is to find out if I really believe what I think I believe. Because the word essay comes from the word essay, which means to test for gold. And wh what it means is, um, so you write something that you think is true, more or less true, and as you write it, you see that you're bluffing, or that you never felt this, or that you're just fooling yourself, and you throw it away. But usually you have at least a sentence or a paragraph or a way to go. And I am a rewriter. And it takes me a while to get comfortable with the piece. Yeah. But the thing is, I love the structure of the essay. And I've read a lot of essays, and I enjoy watching how they do things. And so, um, uh, well, how did that come to me? Well, it really happened. I mean, it's so amazing. The thing I still can't get over is that the adult red-eyed vireo, when I opened that sash a little bit, didn't fly away. You know? I mean, it's, that's amazing. And how brave the little bird was. Of course, what I haven't told you is how much I missed it for the next week or so, you know. But that's true, I did. And, uh, but it's exciting, and it's like children. I mean, you raise them, and then they grow up, <laughs> and they go up. I have time for more questions, if anybody wants. In awe of your laser like observation of all things around you, mm -hmm. your quietness and your, the way you just watch, observe, pay attention, and write about it and uh. with feeling. And um, yeah, so that's all I It's not a question, it's just a it's just an admiration of your work. Well, I'm so lucky to have you as a reader, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I hope you like this book. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. But here's something, if, you, if I may respond to what you just said. Um, so the last essay in the book, uh, when I was arranging the order, you know, um, that's important too. What comes after what and where we're going with this, you know, what we mean by putting one after another. The last essay in the book, was about, uh, I think I said I was eight or nine. I, get, I, I don't know if I was eight or nine. And it was about finding an injured girl. And uh, as I wrote it, I mean, uh, interesting things happen when you write something that um, you think you barely remember. Well, first of all, you remember an awful lot, you know. And I had never held an injured animal. And um, I think that that stayed with me. Uh, you know, if you look for places in your life that make you change directions or, so, or make a direction that you didn't even realize at the time. And, and I think that was it. And, and that's why I put it last. Yeah. But the other one was, um, the story about my mother. I, uh, mothers are complicated, and um, she was uh, a remarkable person. And um, I think I got it right, but um, uh, I, I got this story by losing something she gave me that was important to her. So I wrote about that, yeah. I, I think, so I, I think I remember Book that, I, that we both had read like years ago, the one that came out in 2010, right? Settled in the Woods. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, that was that talked a lot about your family, right? Your mom and your dad. Did, I mean, you know, I haven't read it, it in a long time. And I have, and I'm thinking because I read a lot, so I'm yeah. thinking that was yeah, that was many many books ago, but it stood out to me. But I think I really like the story about the stories about your family. That My first family. family. Yeah, yeah, your parents. Right. Yeah, I found. I, Remember, now I'm going to go back that. and look at it. But that yeah, first. I, <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I don't mind reading it. Thank you. Yet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the first book that, that um, came out, what came out, Yankee asked me to write a book. And that was when they had a press. And they were great. I mean, they really promoted their books. Um, but um, a. Um, a reviewer just reviewed this book in the Wall Street Journal. Wow. And he said something like, well, her first book, what you could tell that they weren't essays, that they were articles. And you know, I think he was probably right. I have to go back and look again. Um, uh, so he must have liked the whole idea of crafting an essay. And and they, maybe they were presented as articles. I don't huh. I don't remember, but I did write a lot about our living in Prospect Harbor mm -hmm. and raising yeah. our kids, and then moving to Surrey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I I write about what's around me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm very lucky in a way. I mean. I think that uh, I live way back in the woods. I mean, the driveway, you know, takes a little bit, and um, and I live alone. I'm, I'm not married anymore, and I think sometimes people don't realize how good that can be. You know, maybe it's not always good, or they think that maybe that's hard for me. And actually, I think one reason I can pay attention is because of that stillness there. Anyhow, I think so. But it wouldn't work for me if I didn't have a terrific neighborhood right around me. Yeah, yeah. But your work makes me look at my stuff very differently. You know, to pay attention to what's out my window. My, I'm into birds. I love birds. I'm yeah. into birding. So I, I watch them. But after I read yours, I watch them even. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just something. Yeah, I just paid more attention to what was in my yard as opposed to going out and seeking what was out there in other places. It's like I'm missing the forest for the trees. You know? <laughs> so pay attention and. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Uh, there was something I was going to say about that. Oh. Well, you'll see in this, but I think I've always written, here's, here, here's what I think about writing, is that um, if somebody like you responds to my writing, uh, I already know that. In other words, I'm not writing to try to tell you something you don't know, unless it's that you feel the same way I do. And perhaps you forgot that for a minute or something like that. That it's sort of us there. I've always felt that. And it really is true. I mean, if you pay attention to people, it may not be birds. We love birds. But uh, it may be something else. Um, and, uh, and it's as if when I do the essay that I'm going to use my memory of what I know to, in a sense, make a narrative that includes the people who are reading it, because they have, they would have stories of their own. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Just to follow that up, could you talk a little bit about um, the intersection of art and advocacy right now at this moment? I know that you're writing, you talk about Ed Abbey and some other environmental writers being mm -hmm. influences, um, and just wanted to see if you could speak to that at this critical moment in human history, what, if, whether you're thinking about that when you're writing, um, trying to um, educate people about the situation we're in or shape their views at all. Are you, are you 
working in advocacy. Yes. Yeah, and we're really interested. We're, we're planning a really amazing event in, um, for the springtime, uh, working with some writers and some musicians, um, and are thinking about this issue a lot and just wanted to hear right. your thoughts on right. it. Right. Well, um, <clears throat> I have a lot of thoughts on them, but they're probably not going to be terribly articulated. Um, you know, the trouble is uh, getting so angry that you paralyze yourself. The thing is, uh, I, I, a friend of mine came to the launch of the book. I mean, he's a dear person. And he was sitting in the front row. And he said, you know, the thing about you is that when you write, and you write about some hard stuff, it's not an angry book. And I thought, boy, you should see me in the morning sometimes. Yeah. You know? I am angry, but I'm not just angry. I'm also incredibly grateful. Now, when I wrote the seaweed book, what I don't think I got into as much as that was really there is the fight that went on between the people. Now, that was in 2018, and things have changed. Um, but there were different factions about har wild harvest, about growing it, and, um, and about having the Canadians come down with the biggest seaweed company in the whole world and, and harvest our coast. And I was shocked at, at how angry people could be at each other. And why couldn't we, <laughs> you know, why couldn't we just do it right? For instance, I still have been convinced by one of the people, and she was in the minority, that Ascophyllum, not in Iraq, which grows so tall, you know, right along the shore and is exposed at low tide, um, has an enormous value that we haven't discovered. The problem is, we don't know very much. And so, to go and mess something up when we don't really know very much, when we already have trouble with our oceans, uh, seems to, insane to me, but people need jobs. I mean, I was cutting fish in the fish factory. They were bringing those fish in from Canada because we had cut them when they were spawning. And the women and I, we were, all the cutters were women, and they would, we would cut them. I was told I was the slowest cutter they'd ever hired. <laughs> but anyhow, we cut them, and the eggs would be all over our aprons. And we were the women doing it. I mean, just imagine that. Anyhow, back to the seaweed. So, uh, there's this one lone voice, this woman, who, whose name is uh, Robin Hadley Sewell. Sewell. I, I know her very well. All of a sudden, I can't remember her last name. It's, she's in the seaweed book. Anyhow, she had this lone fight about not cutting Ascafilm. And she had so many people against her. But slowly but surely, um, people have asked her to come and speak at different towns. Maybe. The problem is that people cutting the ask of film need jobs. And there's the fisheries, you know, we've already messed those up quite a bit. So, uh, we have to be smarter about this. I mean, we can fix all this. I probably haven't answered your question, but uh, what I'd like to really write about, and I wrote a little bit in here, but I, I know so many lobstermen, people who go out and lobster fish. They taught me so much. I think they're courageous. I remember them in Prospect Harbor. 
I really think we have to figure out a different way to bring up those tracks because uh, there was a there was a talk a zoom talk by a woman who worked with uh, Allied Whale and she went out she goes out in Bar Harbor and takes people out to watch whale watch but she also you know you you identify humpbacks by the pattern of their um, flukes. And so that's slightly different. So she was showing us these slides, and I thought, you crazy woman, you should not be showing us these slides. There were so many injured flukes, and they were injured from rope, or um, being hit by chips. But can you imagine writing a book about this? I mean, I think about it. And how long you've lived? <laughs> no, I'm serious. What I mean, this is the Lobster Coast. Yeah. So, uh, but I'm I haven't given up the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we think about this idea all the time. Um, it's really rooted in the work that we're doing. I worked on a lobster boat for a few years, um, and and support the whales on this particular issue. And I feel like the key right now, or at least what our strategy is trying to get people from away to care about it enough. Usually, I mean, right now, Pingree and Mills and all of the uh, reasonable-minded environmental folks in the state support the lobstermen, and I understand why, because right. they need to, to stay right. viable. And so the work that we're doing right here from Maine is to, uh, we were connected with folks out um, in Northwest Montana. There's an amazing writer named Rick Bass that we're working very closely <laughs> with. Yes. And he, he's writing books uh, about the Yak Valley. Uh, we went and visited with him this summer. Oh, lucky you. And, and got to hike through the, the Kootenai National Forest. And what he's told us was that Congresswoman Pingree, just really briefly, she's the chairwoman of the subcommittee in DC that controls the Federal Forest Service's budget. And so if we could get the logging, commercial logging of old growth without environmental impact statements, which is what's happening out there, onto her radar and get Mainers to care about it, then we could intervene, uh, or Pingree could intervene on our behalf because the Democrats out there can't touch the issue in the same way that Pingree and Mills and other people have to back the lobstermen. Um, and so the key is getting people from away to care enough to make it a big issue for Pingree so that she's forced to intervene. And that's what we've been working to do and have had, we've been able to get, um, we had a meeting with her. She, we got to put together a big letter and she took a meeting with us and we invited Rick and uh, Terry Tempest Williams and Bill McKibben to join us at the meeting and they came and it was, and we've since gotten Robin Wall Kimmerer and a bunch of other amazing writers on board and sending letters to Pingree and she's stepped up and the project out there, it's 95,000 acres of old growth and it's been halted for the last year and a half as a result of it. And so now we're trying to work to put it into a more permanently protected posture because it's just informally on hold. And so that's the work we've been doing and we're working with, with writers. Um, good, saw, saw, good writers, well known writers. Yeah, and, yeah. Thought, and saw in the free press that you were gonna be here and talking about <laughs> environmental writing and uh, just your connection with nature, and so we wanted to, to be here. But well, thank we, you. we, we think you. about that parallel with the main lobstermen and how tricky it is to lead the charge um, on behalf of the whales from the coast of Maine, but uh, how folks. So we trade off the, the people that, that have the forest out in Montana, protect the whales, and exactly. they protect. <laughs> exactly. Well, before, before you leave, write down your name, because if I ever decided that I had the courage, uh, you know, I don't even think I could do what Joe Polis did in that coach, I'd probably hand over the pipe. But anyhow, um, well, I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, we were with Rick out in Northwest Montana, and he writes about this issue passionately, and we were a little nervous going yeah. down the logging roads with him. It was just the three of us, and it was, you could feel, I mean, he's, he's, it's, he's doing a brave thing, speaking out against it out there. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. People have taken notice. He's yeah. not the most popular guy in town. But, no. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> no. But it's making a real difference. Yeah. Well, if anybody wants to help me, help me figure out how to write about whales and also, in some sense, um, honor the work, uh, the knowledge that lobstermen have had. Yeah. Anyhow, that's one of many things. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? I am so delighted. Did you? Is that a question? Oh, no, I was just saying that. No, isn't that how it goes? There was one person in this room, and then there's so much. Yeah. You walked in, and there's so much more now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it really, I've enjoyed this very much. It was worth the drive. Whether I can find my way home is questionable, <laughs> but I may, um, I may make it. Anyhow. Thank you so much, and, and um, I think this book should be at, at the bookstores. I think you have three here in Rockland, don't you? Yes. Yeah, we got Hello, Hello, um, Sherman's, and the new one Arctic on Turn. Arctic Turn. Arctic Turn, that's the one. Yeah. Arctic Turn, they call it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't been to this book. Oh, it's our little great book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why you can't have writers with books here. Yeah. Because you can't choose between the three, so the, so the people who come to listen have to go buy their own books at their their favorite bookstore. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.